Have you been paying too much for rent? Across the country, the rent prices skyrocketed in 2022 and 2023, and it could be because of illegal activity. The Justice Department on Friday filed an antitrust suit against RealPage, a Texas-based software company that's accused of using algorithms to allow widespread collusion among landlords. Everybody knows the rent is too damn high, and we allege this is one of the reasons why. When uh, companies, uh, and in this case landlords, um, uh, use a software tool to facilitate uh, cooperation with respect to rents, they violate the antitrust laws, they make rents higher than they would otherwise be, and they prevent rents from going down. The federal government joins attorneys general from eight states in suing RealPage. The company, which has been fighting these allegations for years, says the case lacks merit and will do nothing to bring down rent prices. We are disappointed that after multiple years of education and cooperation on the antitrust matters concerning RealPage, the DOJ has chosen this moment to pursue a lawsuit that seeks to scapegoat pro-competitive technology that has been used responsibly for years, RealPage said in a statement. Well, we have high rents, accusations of collusion, and an algorithm in the middle of it. To understand more about the case, I'm joined by Spencer Weber Waller, professor and director of the Institute for Consumer Antitrust Studies at Loyola University. Professor, what is the difference between RealPage suggesting rent prices and, say, what we would see from a Zillow or Redfin estimate? Well, as, as I understand it, I'm only working on, um, you know, publicly available information. Uh, you know, RealPage is a software system that uh, has a very high market share uh, among uh, landlords in places like New York and I, I think some other cities. And the, the gist of this case, and it's an interesting, it's a, it's a collusion case, it's a price fixing case, it's a cartel case, but it's not one where the landlords are accused of directly communicating or agreeing among themselves. Um, it's kind of a what we would call a um, hub and spoke conspiracy, where the people who are the defendants, the, you know, the, the landlords are using a common agent, a third party, to coordinate their behavior. And the complaint talks about how each of these um, <clears throat> uh, large landlords uh, feeds a variety of confidential proprietary information, and then the the algorithm. And, and RealPage communicates with them only, but it's the effect, it, it, it's effectively the same as them communicating with each other because um, RealPage has access to all of this confidential information, uses it to formulate, according to the complaint, uh, common recommendations that are inevitably followed by the landlord and you end up with essentially the same result as if they had gone into a room or, you know, emailed each other and agreed to um, a, sort of a common and ever escalating rent for the various, you know, apartment buildings and other stuff that they own. RealPage has been obviously fighting these allegations for a couple of years now, ever since this reporting first started to come out and then, you know, the allegations and the lawsuits. But, you know, RealPage first off is saying, look, we're not the ones that are the reason that, you know, prices are so high. That's a lack of housing, which that's a very fair point. Uh, we certainly need more housing in this country. Um, but two, that their, their customers aren't required to use this price. And in fact, many of them don't use the suggested price, that this is an algorithm and it, you know, gives them information for them to do what they want with it. So I, I guess I would say it's not as if this case is quite cut and dry, right? It's it's pretty complex. Where Where's the argument here that the DOJ and these other states are going to have to make in order to prove their case? Yeah. Um, and, the, you know, there's two sets of, of cases going on and we, we can talk about them if you want. One is this government action that was filed late last week. And then uh, there's separate some class actions where, uh, you know, groups of consumers are saying that they've overpaid. So um, the antitrust laws would not deal with a situation where a landlord had high prices on their own unless they were a monopoly and that isn't at stake here. So uh, high prices by themselves are not a violation of the antitrust laws without something more. The something more in this case is that real page is being, you know, uh, alleged in a civil case. Nobody's going to jail. Uh, the government case has no fines, but uh, the government is trying to stop the use of a common a platform, a common algorithm, a common kind of coordination point. And this has been done before. If you go all the way back to the 1930s, there was a similar kind of case involving the movie industry where the government won, where uh, they couldn't really prove that the movie studios were trying to coordinate on price that would be charged in the movie theaters during the Great Depression. They couldn't really prove that the movie studios talked to each other. But um, 
they had each sent uh, sort of a common letter to their distributors talking about the prices that would be set. And, you know, that was enough. So th this hub and spoke where you use a third party to coordinate is an accepted legal strategy. Of course, the government has to prove uh, this, uh, but the complaint has a solid legal theory. Other countries use uh, similar kinds of coordination. I was an expert for the government of Chile some years ago where supermarkets were coordinating their price uh, through a wholesaler. But again, there was no evidence that they specifically talked to each other. They may have, but we, they, the government couldn't prove it. But to use a common agent to then formulate a plan to set a common price and or raise it, uh, those are illegal under U.S. law. Again, if you can, if you can prove it. If you can prove it. And, and wondering, because this has to do with an algorithm, it has to do with a specific software um, we are really, you know, entering an era where AI and algorithms are going to be ruling business. How it, how important is it to be, I don't know, mindful or what, what sort of things can we take away from the fact that, you know, algorithms are going to be calling a lot of the shots more and more? Yeah. Um, antitrust is grappling with this. The basic, we didn't quite you know, have a chance to talk about this, but the basic requirement for violation of Section 1 in the Sherman Act is some agreement in restraint of trade. It doesn't have to be a written agreement. It doesn't even have to be a formal agreement. It can be approved by direct or circumstantial evidence. Um, and, you know, if, if you... Um, if you saw, you know, a bunch of people um, and, and you asked them how much for an apple on the street and they each said 43.25 cents and there was no, you know, and you just said no, that would be kind of odd, right? And you'd, you'd look into it and you try to see if they had some mechanism by which they coordinated that price. Now, uh, it would be a pretty cut and dried case if uh, each, <clears throat> um, each real estate company or anybody else coordinated through an accountant through a trade association or just like some expert consultant. There are all kinds of cases like this where if you feed this common, highly proprietary, highly detailed, forward-looking information to a third person who formulates recommendations, right? And then the recommendations are followed. Um, that has held in other circumstances, other factual circumstances, to be enough to show an agreement. And that's what the government is alleging here. And the fact that it's um, a permutation involving an algorithm rather than a human, you know, or a, a, an old-fashioned way of coordinating is interesting. Um, but it's a uh, that's acceptable in a legal theory. And again, the law is reasonably easy. The facts are hard. Okay. And, and what do you expect RealPage to come forward with to say this is absolutely not collusion? It's not an antitrust violation. Well, at this stage, you know, a complaint has been filed that I'm going to put on my, my hat as a civil procedure professor rather than an antitrust person. Um, what happens now is the defendant has a choice. They can either file an answer, uh, which just says, you, you admit, you deny, or you don't know about the allegation. So, you know, they would admit, they would admit that they're real page and they're incorporated wherever they're incorporated. And uh, they would then admit and deny the, the key paragraphs of, of the complaint. Uh, and then the case goes into discovery. Most defendants in this situation <clears throat> uh, file a motion to dismiss that says, even if the law, uh, even if everything in the complaint is true, it doesn't amount to a violation of the law. Judge has to decide that. As I understand it, uh, the government's case uh, is it, going to be decided by a judge, not a jury. I, I might be wrong about that. But, but anyway, the judge has to decide a motion to dismiss. And uh, the judge has to accept everything in the complaint as true and then measure it up against the law. And as I was saying, the law is supportive of the government's case. They're smart people. They have good lawyers on this. The states are important partners in this case. They have other uh, very gifted antitrust lawyers who work on this in conjunction with the DOJ. And so um, a little bit's about the predilections of the, the, of the, of the, of the judge, <clears throat> but um, I would expect that uh, this is a strong complaint. That's a good chance of making it through the motion to dismiss. At that point, the defendants have kind of a moment of truth. Do they want to spend the time and money uh, turning over all their documents and depositions and uh, other information to the government, a bunch of which they've already had to do? So they sort of know what's, what's coming. And at that point, um, given that nobody's going to jail and the government doesn't get any money out of this, uh, I would expect them to have some serious conversations about settling this case if, uh, again, they survive that motion to dismiss. If the defendants are successful in their motion to dismiss, the case is over and the government would have to appeal. Spencer Weber Waller, professor and director of the Institute for Consumer Antitrust Studies at Loyola University. Thank you so much for breaking this down for us. Like you said, it is a complex case and we're glad you were here to do it. All right. Thanks, Simone.